Hey everyone, David Bombal back with a very special guest. In this case, it's Donald. Donald, I know you mainly from being a co-author of these books with Todd Lemley, but tell us a bit more about yourself. Hey David, I'm a principal consultant at a large uh, Cisco partner there. So I work as a subject matter expert for pretty much all things Cisco these days. So that's the boring routing and switching stuff to wireless <laughs> to uh, collaboration um, all, and to the funner SDN things like ACI and SD-WAN, all that fun stuff. And in later years, I've become um, the uh, cloud SME there. I am a Azure solutions expert and DevOps expert. Uh, and then I moved on to be more of a DevOps uh, SME there for um, uh, dealing with our various automation needs uh, in the project there. But uh, they always find a reason to call me in the middle of the night, so I'm quite busy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for everyone's reference, I really recommend these books that Todd and Donald wrote. I remember reading the SDN section and the automation section that Donald specifically wrote, and I thought it was a brilliant uh, part of the book. He explains very practically and very easily how things work. And Donald, that gets us to our topic. In the book, you discuss Ansible. So could you, just for everyone who's watching, give us a quick overview or description of what Ansible is and why you would recommend that for someone who wants to get into network automation or DevNet or something? Uh, the best way to think about Ansible is that it's automation's easy button because what it does is it lets you define more your intent on what you want to do more than all the step-by-steps kind of thing there. So if you, uh, if I remember correctly from my book, um, I write out a simple example how to do something in Python. It turns out to be about 60 lines or so. And the point being there is when you code something in Python, you need to tell it every little step of what you need to do. Whereas if you're using something like Ansible, you can use the abstraction to say, hey, I just want a, a web server installed, uh, figure out how to install it rather than uh, telling it, okay, you need to run yum or apt or something like that. And push the configuration. So it makes it very nice for um, abstraction. It also has a nice feature called item potency. And the idea here is that it's only going to do something if it needs to be done. And the benefit there is it's not going to run a uh, mindlessly run a script every single time there because what if that causes an outage on your router there because you're pushing a new loopback address and taking out your BGP or something like that. Whereas with item potency, what you're saying is that, uh, hey, I'm going to um, check that router first, make sure there's a, uh, that loopback isn't there. And then if it is, I'm going to skip to the next step. And if it is, I'm going to create it. So it gives you a lot more flexibility and more confidence to be able to run the script every single time without having any um, unexpected uh, disasters. And that's, you know, of course, you mess something up in your configuration. But... <laughs> That's the point of automation. You can always cause big issues pretty quickly. I don't want to keep you any any longer, Donald. Can you give us an example? Because what you're going to show us, hopefully, is uh, practical examples of using Ansible. Yeah, so I figured I would go through um, the basics of uh, configuring um, some stuff on um, some Cisco gear. That'd be great. And we'll walk through some of the fundamentals and stuff that we need to... Um, that you need to uh, be aware of. And uh, I'm sure you have some questions as we go along. Oh, definitely, yeah, I'm gonna push you. Uh, so this is my PyCharm. Uh, I use this as my main ID for most uh, coding stuff there. So what I've done is I've just created an empty uh, project there. Where we're just calling David's Ansible. And what we're gonna do is just walk through some of the foundations that we need to get Ansible up and running. And then we'll get this synced to my um, server with some GitHub magic, and then we'll uh, do some examples and see what kind of fun we can have. That'd be great. All right, so first thing I'm gonna do is create a file. And the first file that I wanna create is going to be hosts. And I can call this anything I want an extension, but I'm gonna show you the simple way of creating a host file, and then we'll show you the new and improved way. So we're going to call this .ini, which denotes the INI format. And this is a really easy format that is um, going to let us define what host Ansible knows about. And we do this because Ansible does not have any agent to inform Ansible of uh, what hosts are used like Puppet does. So we have to tell 
ask well explicitly how, what hosts are out there and how do we connect to them. So just before you car- carry on, Donald, can you give us a quick like 30 second, uh, you mentioned like agent. So what is agent, agentless? And you've mentioned the difference between Puppet and um, Ansible, yeah? All right, so um, the main difference between these tools, just as a reminder, is that uh, the IAC tools come into one of two uh, categories. We have agents and agentless. Now, like most things in the CCNA, they kind of tell you most of the truth there, but when you get dig deeper, it gets more complicated than that. But for right now, uh, the CCNA says that the um, agent is required for Puppet. And they want it for Chef. For agentless, the only one on the list is Ansible, which is what we're talking about today. And what this means is that uh, if I wanted to use Puppet on a Cisco router, I need to have my switch, or I was just say, instead of a router. And then I would use what's called the guest shell feature to uh, deploy the Puppet agent on top of it. And then the Puppet agent would register to the Puppet Master, which is a um, topic for another day. And it would say, hi, I am an agent on the uh, Switch's guest shell. And then uh, Puppet would be able to say, okay, I can push commands to it. Whereas Ansible, we don't have any of that structure. So uh, the um, what we have to do is we have to define a, what's called an inventory file. And what this is going to do is just going to define, okay, here is our switch, here is our router, and we're going to tell it how we're actually going to connect to it there. So we'll have our user, our pass, all that kind of stuff, and it will be uh, stored in this file, and then we reference that when we do our configurations. There's some more advanced things we can do, like we can do uh, what's called a dynamic inventory. So it can query, like, say, your cloud environment and um, pull that up. Or we can do more um, uh, fancy stuff, but uh, for the most part, the inventory file is a text file that we um, have all the information in. And then for Puppet and whatnot, uh, we have an agent that we actually install something on the computer to do it. That host file is your inventory file, yeah? Yes. Great. And I mean, you use uh, Ansible. I just want to ask all the questions that people may be asking. Yep. Ansible typically uses SSH to SSH to a router switch, yeah? Yeah, so typically Ansible will use um, SSH for its connections. It can also use, um, depending on the solution, it can use various APIs. So, for example, if you had like an Arista switch, it can use the um, eAPI, which is their extensible API. If you're on a Nexus switch, it can use the uh, NX API, which is the Nexus API. Yeah, so it depends on the solution. And when we get into the actual um, meat and potatoes of Ansible, so you can see uh, exactly what is used for different uh, modules or playbooks is what they call them. But we'll, we'll concentrate on SSH for today, yeah? Yeah. Great. All right, so in the host uh, INI file, this is a really simple file. We're not gonna spend too much time on it because it's kind of um, boring. But uh, what you do, <laughs> is all, uh, you need to tell it uh, what groups you care about and what um, hosts are in there. So for example, I have an Ansible, env- or it's like I have some routers that are running and for convenience sake right now, I am actually running them as virtual machines. So I have three routers and then I also have uh, a Linux server too if we have time to look at it there, but we might have to save that for another day. Uh, But the main thing is I have three uh, modern Cisco routers running that I should be able to connect to. And if we connect to those routers before we get too deep into it, the main things that we need here, because it's SSH, is we need to make sure we have our login set up. So what I've done is... I have set up... um, a simple admin uh, password. I have set up uh, a secret. And then I have set up um, 
uh, authentication so that it uses AAA, and that's all I've really done on the router so far. So you haven't created IP addresses, anything like that yet? Uh, there is... Actually, I can get rid of this guy. Uh, so... So all I should have on here now is a virtual port group, which is for guest shell, and that's not really something we're talking about today. And then we have um, our management connection, which is in the BRF. It's doing something with DHP. Um, but uh, we have our um, management connection in uh, management VRF and everything else is basically the same except for my login stuff. So uh, real basic uh, configuration here. And um, is SSH, you're going to show us how to set up the SSH portion. Was that enabled already? Uh, it's not enabled already. So Cisco is pretty easy. You just need a domain name. So I'm just going to say domain name, the packet. Um, I'll just type it correctly, apparently. Automation can't save you from typos, people. <laughs> uh, but, um, and then all you need to do is just make sure you have a key. So just generate modulus 2048. And then that's all you really need to do for most uh, systems there. And then you might also need to go uh, under the lines, and say transport import SSH. And that's all you really need to do for SSH on a Cisco device. Um, it basically it wants to work. You just uh, give it enough details for it to um, be able to connect. And just to make sure I understand, and for everyone's benefit, you're running um, VMware Workstation or Fusion or something locally, and you've just got these as three VMs running. Is that right? Yeah, just to show you what that looks like. So I have um, the next gen, um, or I guess current gen now, um, virtual routers from Cisco, the uh, um, 8000Bs. Yeah, yeah, and all I've done is I've deployed them, and then one trick I do for a lab, which you might like, is that I add a serial port, and then I pump the uh, serial information to a what's called a named pipe, which is uh, basically a connection socket, and then from there I connect to the um, uh, session with my secure CRT. Uh, to the name pipe there. And this is how I simulate a serial connection um, without having to uh, mess with uh, IP addresses and SSH or whatnot there. So um, this way, if we need to reboot the router or whatnot there, we don't get disconnected and all that kind of fun stuff. So that's all, all the tricks I've done for the lab. That's great. So basic SSH, basic IP address, that's really all you need um, if I had a physical device and now we can do the Ansible portion. Yeah, exactly. All right, so back to our friendly pie charm. Here we go. So the I and I, dead simple. First thing we need to do is tell it what group uh, we're doing, and we do this just by putting it in square brackets. So if I want routers, I can say routers, and then I tell it what I want there. So if I had DNS names, which I do, I can say AKV31 dot the packet for whatever, or I can do it by IP address. It's totally up to your environment. So my IPs here are. 1081, 82. The only caveat is if you use IP, sorry, if you use domain names, you've obviously got to have a DNS server or something that's resolved. Yeah, you would have to make sure you have entries and keep them up to date. Uh, yeah. It yeah. really depends on what suits your environment. Usually if a lab, you don't really care that much, to be honest, but um, it's always worth a shot there. Uh, now, you can do it this way. There's nothing wrong with it there. Or if you want to save some room, you can take advantage of... Um, some of the syntax that lets you have more um, flexibility. So I can do this in one line by just saying, opening up another square brackets and saying one, three. And basically this is saying, okay, this is 81, 82, and 83. So the first number is where you start your um, loop and the last number is where you end it there. So if I had 10 routers, I'm gonna say, well, nine routers, I could say uh, nine. And then that's going to uh, go from 81 to 89 there. And it's just a way of that's helping nice. us uh, save a little bit of typing there. Because if you have a proper inventory, you could have quite a lot of devices in here. So anyway, I'll put that back to three. I'm going to forget about it. Uh, I could also, if I had a switch I want to connect to, I could say switches. And we could say that we want... Um, 
I'll just say, I think that's 241 is my switch. And then if I had to group this together, I could just say, hey, this is going to be uh, DC children, if I can type. And then I would just say, hey, this is routers and this is switches, and you would build it up that way. But anyway, we're not going to bother with that. We're just going to focus on routers for right now. And the names, the names are just names that you've made up. It doesn't have to be routers or switches. Yeah, yeah. I could call this David's Super Router Adventure. <laughs> now, I would have to type this if I want to reference it in the playbook there, so someone might look at you. That's a bit. That's a bit. That's a bit too long. So let's rather just go with routers. Yeah, routers probably the better way to go here. Um, I like to try and keep this relatively descriptive. Um, when you get into um, more production, there you want to you'll take more advantage of the uh, subgroups and whatnot, like I showed you there. And when we get into the next format, it'll give you even more flexibility. So. Now we have this, we are telling Ansible, okay, point here, but we're not telling it how to actually connect. So what we need to do is give it uh, a variable section. And what we do is we say the name of the thing, which is routers, and I will say bars uh, for variables. And in here we have to give it some um, information of how we're connecting and um, what we're connecting to and uh, how we're actually connecting it there. So. This stuff is online, but this kind of burned to my memory. So I'm just going to say that the connection for a network device is going to be network CLI. And when we get into the actual documentation side of things, I'll show you how to verify this kind of stuff there. But um, depending on how you actually connect to the device there, whether it's for API or SSH or whatnot there, this will change. But for the most part, network CLI is a safe bet. And then the next thing it asks you for is needs to know what type of device it is. So that's network OS. And in our case, this is iOS because it's Cisco. And then if it was Junos, it'd be Juniper. Uh, if it was Juniper, it'd be Junos and so on and so forth. Then we need to give it some username and password. So we're gonna say user, it's going to be admin. And then I just put a really simple password here, which is just going to be Dextro, because when I was young, I thought that was a cool <laughs> password from OSB up, but I spelled it wrong and I just kept it that way. That's nice. So anyway, uh, this is um, our basic um, host INI file, and this is um, enough to connect to devices and move from there. I'm gonna, just gonna quickly show you the new way of doing things, because it's a bit more robust. And what we do here is we make a YAML file instead. So we're just gonna go ahead and go new file, Host YAML. This is our first YAML file, and this is what Ansible does most of its work with there. So there's two main things to uh, remember with YAML. The first is that it always starts with three dashes on the top, so it knows it's a YAML file. And then uh, the other thing is that spacing is very important in YAML. So uh, it uses spacing to determine what is um, part of each section there. And if you get a space even slightly wrong, it's gonna break everything there. That's kind of the why YAML can be really annoying when you're working with it. But uh, this is also why you wanna use a nice editor like uh, PyCharm or what have you there, cause it will help you keep track of your spacing as you type. So you, you hopefully we won't have too many issues here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna open up a group and we're just gonna call this data center. And then basically how we do this is we type the thing and then we have a colon after each one and then we would uh, fill in the information as we go. And what we're going to say is we're going to put some routers and switches in here. So we're going to say children. And then we want routers. Now here's where we're a little bit different because it's a bit more structured. So. Uh, before we just said that, okay, here's our group and here's our IPs. Now we're just going to have a bit more formats. So we're just going to say hosts. And then we have the same thing, really. So we can say 10, 8, 3, 1. And basically what we're saying is we we're creating a master group called data center. And right now we have another subgroup called routers. And then under here, we have another group, which is these IP addresses there. So uh, basically this is still considered a group. We haven't put any information in it yet. And that's because you're putting colons at the end, yeah? Yeah. 
when you press, you're just pressing enter after you've typed uh, like a group. And yeah, then, so uh, the yeah, tools yeah. automatically keep keeping, um, the tools are auto automatically keeping the uh, space in there. And I don't know if it comes out for you, but uh, you see here that it's maintain show visibly showing me the line. So I can yeah, see yeah. that uh, how they're spaced out. Whereas uh, if you use something like um, a standard text editor, it's not going to maintain that there and you're guaranteed to have a problem at some point in your life. Yeah, so we have uh, network engineers need to move from Notepad to PyCharm or something. Yeah, it's worth the investment. Uh, I know a lot of people are like, "Why are you spending money on a text editor?" And it's like, uh, "Well, I have you know, I spend money on basically all the text editors, but uh, <laughs> they they all have their use, or at least that's what I tell myself." All right, so what we can also do here is under um, the host. You see, yeah, when I back up there, it highlights uh, that I'm under this line now. So if I wanted to have a host specific uh, variable, I can go ahead and say bars. And then if I wanted something like test bar, I can go ahead and say 999. So basically I can define uh, whatever variables I want under the router group here. And then we can do essentially the same thing for Switches, so we'll just say hosts, and we're just gonna say 10, 30, 10, 241, I think. And then what we'll do is we will go under, and so like on so forth, I like I wanted to add web servers, whatnot, I could. Uh, but we're gonna go back until we get to children. Because we basically want the variables to apply to both the routers and the switches. And we're just going to say bars again. And we put basically the same information that we had before. So this is going to be Asphalt Connection, Network CLI, and then it's going to be Asphalt Network OS. By the way, if you forget Network OS, uh, the script will fit or the playbook will fail and it'll basically say, hey, I don't know what this is. Uh, so we'll play with that once we get something going here in a minute. But the good news is uh, it looks like we're just putting a lot of effort into the host file. But after we're done this, we can basically dive right into the uh, playing with Ansible there because this is 90% of what we need aside from the actual playbook. So let's go Ansible user will be admin Ansible SS, oops, SSH pass. You might misspelled Dextra, and we'll add a couple other things. We'll say NTP servers will be 10 and 11. All right, so now I have my host done. Can I just ask, is the, um, is the YAML file, the hosts file, a, a replacement of the, um, of the hosts.ini file? Yes, so uh, it's one or the other. Uh, basically the same information is on here, except for I added the switch and I added the NTP servers. And which one is recommended today? Uh, the YAML is. So it's better to, to basically, you have to learn YAML if you want to use Ansible, yeah? Yeah, uh, YAML is, uh, mandatory. It's, uh, when we get to the playbooks, everything is written in YAML. Uh, so, uh, you're going to have to learn it pretty quickly for this kind of solution. And frankly, other solutions like Puppet also use YAML, so, uh. There's no escaping it. So in, in, in your YAML file, can you just explain, you use dash and then the IP addresses of the NTP servers. What's the difference between the item with a dash and then the, the items in orange? Yeah, so this is just an array. So basically it's just saying I have multiple values and this is just saying I have a single value. Great. All right, so we have our host out of the way. There's one more quality of life thing we can do before we move into Ansible itself. And that's gonna create a global settings file called ansible.cfg. And all this does is just gives us our default there so that we uh, don't have too much of a painful time. So we're gonna just say it's gonna be defaults and this is still INI format. So uh, I don't believe they made this YAML yet, but uh, I'm sure it's coming. But for right now, um, your default settings uh, work with INI right now. And the main one that we care about is host key checking 
false. And the reason why this is important is it uses SSH keys for its um, connection. So what happens here is when we have our device, our Ansible server, and it's talking to, let's just say a router, it's going to connect uh, through SSH and it's going to say, hey, hold on, do I know R1's keys in my um, SSH store? And if it doesn't, it's going to kill the connection because it's going to assume that uh, if this was production, you would know about it and you would learn the keys already. So what we do for a lab environment, because we don't want a painful time because our routers are usually up for 10, 20 minutes at a time and then they're deleted and uh, created over again, that kind of thing. So we use host key checking and set it to false and that's just going to make it much easier for a lab. But Otherwise, it's going to validate the SSH keys and you're going to have to manually connect to the service before you run your script. So it's going to fail or you're going to have to do some kind of automation method to make sure that the Ansible server knows about the keys. That's great. I mean, another question I'm sure people always ask, whenever I've done this, people ask, you're putting your passwords in, in your files in clear text. Is there a better way to do it? Uh, yeah, there is. Uh, so there is a feature called Ansible Vault and um, we'll talk about that, I'm sure, in one of these discussions. But uh, Basically what it does is it encrypts the password in a really cool format, and then we can use that to um, uh, encrypt the password so we're not doing it uh, in plain text. Uh, the other way you can go is uh, to do it entirely with uh, SSH keys and whatnot there, but um, Vault is the preferred way for most people. Great. And then the other one that is just a me thing, but because we're using a newer version of Ansible, in fact, the newest, uh, it starts yelling about, by the way, 10 versions for now, we're gonna change something. And uh, that's great information that the sky is falling, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't need to see it every single time I run something there. It's like, oh, by the way, this is gonna change eventually. It's like, that's great guys, but uh, we don't need to see that. So I'm gonna set deprecation warnings to false. Uh, this is more, uh, so we have cleaner up when we get to it. So at this point, we have, aside from the explanations and whatnot, we have uh, two lines in our CFG, or our CFG file. And then we have a host file with hopefully no typos or spacing errors. Uh, by the way, while I'm here, never use tab in uh, YAML. Uh, YAML does not support tab at all, uh, and it will break your file instantly. So if you're going to use tab, make sure you adjust your editor so that it replaces it with four spaces because otherwise it's going to cause you a real headache. Good advice. But anyway, uh, so what we're going to do is go ahead and create a repository. And I'm going to do that just by saying enable version control. And what we're going to do is we're going to create a repository on my GitHub. So here's my fancy Windows terminal. <laughs> so we're going to go to David's Ansible. And if we look here, we have our files. And we're just going to go ahead and say gh create repo. Nope, oh, I always get that backwards. Repo create. They just released the command line for uh, GitHub and I'm trying to consciously use it more in my workflow. And we're just going to call this David's Ansible. This is going to be a private one. And we'll go ahead and say yes. So what this has done is it's gone ahead and created um, ants or uh, GitHub link for me in my repository. So if I go here and open this up in a browser. You're going to have to make this public so that other, other people can download it. I guess I could. I guess there's no harm in it. Um, okay, uh, let me just do that again then. We'll say break public.
There we go. For the people. Yeah, so anyone watching can just go to that link and download the code. Uh, all right, let's just see here. If I make sure I didn't remember that by changing it on the fly, let's just see here. Go to my GitHub. It says, I see you've got an error. Remote origin already exists. Is that right? Yeah, I'm just going to go ahead and delete that in my repository yeah. and then do that again. Uh, do, do, do. But I just want to make it clear, you don't have to use Git for this. You, you, you don't. You, I'm you, just being fancy. Yeah. You could just copy those files onto your, to a Linux server. Yeah. And that's another question, Donald. I'm sorry, I know you're busy doing something on Git, but do you recommend people use Linux for this? Um, you need to use Linux for Ansible itself. Uh, right now, I've been using Windows for everything. Um, you, there is a question of whether or not you want to use uh, WSL for Ansible. Uh, I find that WSL 1 is um, a little bit uh, wanting there. The Fedora Refresh, or not Refresh, uh, Fedora Remix is the best one for uh, using WSL 1. Uh, WSL 2 I don't really use too much because of the uh, I use VMware Workstation. But um, it should be able to work just fine on WSL 2. And then... Um, Otherwise, uh, I would recommend uh, doing this on um, some kind of Linux host. And on a Mac? Uh, Mac works just fine. Yeah. Because uh, it uh, has SSH and it's uh, uh, brew and whatnot takes care of all the intricacies. So you can use Ansible on Mac just fine. But it's probably, you know, network engineers today have to learn Linux, I would say. So it probably makes sense just to have a Linux VM or WSL or something. And use yeah, Linux. it's the easy, especially if you're going to be doing destructive stuff there because you can might you might find out uh, that you're breaking things. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and get this in GitHub there so you can see how that works because we need to get these files onto my Linux server one way or another. So what we're going to say is we're going to go enable version control in... Um, GitHub, and this is just how, or in uh, PyCharm, and this is just a fancy, or fancy way of getting things up and running there, but we can also do this with the CLI too. So I'm going to show you a mix of both. So we're just going to go ahead and go Git. Uh, I can also do other versions, but Git is the uh, best one uh, for most people. We're just going to go OK here. And that's going to run a Git init on the directory for us. Now we're going to go back to my or rather, I'm going to open up my Windows terminal. And what we're going to say here is we're going to go to that directory, which is oops, coding David's and it's going public. And one of the nice things about Windows Terminal is that it uh, integrates nicely there. So you can see that it has a bunch of Git information that uh, I'm sure Dave and I will be talking about uh, down the road there so you understand what all the stuff means. Uh, be great, yeah. What we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and use the GitHub command line to create a repository just for the fun of it. And I always get this backwards. So I think it's repo create David's Ansible public because uh, we'll make this available to you guys. So you can check it out there if you want to see our random spaghetti code. And then we're going to go ahead and say yes. And apparently I need to clean up my GitHub. So just bear with me one second. I did see you made a mistake. You made a typo with your Ansible public, but that's okay. Yeah, no worries. I just got to delete this guy here and it should be fine. Uh, delete. And what I'm doing is I just uh, did a trial run earlier and it... Uh, Forgot to clean up my tracks here, so. Let this be a lesson to everyone. Never prepare for anything, just do it live. <laughs> because if you prepare, you're gonna end up breaking something. All right, let's try this again. All right, there we go. So now what I can do is I can go ahead and have a look here and we have our directory. So I have our three files. And I'm going to go ahead and say git add Ansible CFG and then our host file. 
And we're just going to go ahead and say get commit. We're going to say our first commit. And we can see that we've added our three files to get here. And then we want to push some to my actual online repository so I can use this in my Ansible server or what will be our Ansible server. So, oh, I got an Ansible in the brain. Uh, now I just want to say Ansible or get push. We got to tell that we're pushing to the master because this is a new repository. And again, we'll make a video one of these days and talk about what all this magical stuff means. And now I'll hit push. Everything's up to date. So if I go to my, if we go to my GitHub itself, we can see that we have David's um, Ansible public. And the cool thing is there that this will be accessible to you guys. Uh, so you can um, go to uh, github.com, the packet for our David's Ansible public, and this will stay up. And um, it's going to uh, have our files as we go here. So if I click on our host file, we can see that we have that there and it's recognizing the formatting or whatnot. So now we have this, our next goal is to get this onto our Linux server, which in my case is Red Hat. So I'm just gonna go ahead and copy this key, uh, the SSH there, and this is just gonna help me do our actual syncing. If you just want your own repository, you won't have SSH but you can do HTTPS on your own, or you can use the GitHub CLI if you're feeling adventurous. Uh, anyway, I'm going to get to my Ansible server. Just gonna go ahead and remove Ansible Lab, because that's something else, and everything else is fine. So what we're going to say is we're going to go git clone. And we're going to enter in the SSH key I um, copied here. And it's going to go ahead and clone it. So someone could just copy this and do exactly the same if they wanted to clone it onto their Linux server. Yeah. Now, you won't be able to do SSH, as I said, but yeah, you can only do HTTP uh, because I manually added my SSH key into GitHub. Yep. So uh, for authentication, that's how I make sure that make sure that you are you. But otherwise, uh, yeah, you can grab this and play around with it if you feel that what we end up doing today is beneficial as a starting point. And then, um, yeah, you can have fun with it. So now we have here, we can see that we have a folder called David's Ansible Public. And we can see we have our Ansible CFG or hosts, and uh, that's about it. But right now we don't really have Ansible. I mean, I have Ansible installed on the server, but let's pretend we don't have Ansible. So what we can do is I can go back out here. And as a good practice, it's always a good idea to create a virtual environment. So we're just gonna say Python 3, because ultimately Ansible runs on Python. You can install it with pip. So we're gonna say that this is virtual environment and virtual environment. And now to activate this, so we basically have our own private container for our packages. We can say source bin activate. And you can see that we have a virtual environment activated in the corner. And now when I install stuff, it's gonna to install to this environment, not my main system. So we're just gonna go ahead and say pip install. And you might have guessed we want Ansible, but before I do that, uh, we're going to make sure we install the new version of pip because otherwise we can get some issues. So we're just going to say pip upgrade. So we can see it's uh, uninstalled pip 9 and installed 21, so that's quite the jump. And then we're just going to say we want Ansible. And you can see that 4.0 is installing now. So just for everyone's benefit, the um, the virtual environment is good practice. It's like a little like container running on your virtual machine, but it's not required. But it's it's good practice so that you don't have conflicting versions. Yeah. Yeah, it's a uh, it's good practice. I'd recommend it there. When you use something like PyCharm, it automatically creates one for you. Uh, so it. Um it uh, keeps that isolated there because you don't want, because uh, there's an Ansible Tower instance here, which we'll talk about one of these days, but um, you don't want to break an actual server because you're installing different versions of um, 
applications there in the same way that you would use a virtual machine, hopefully to test things out rather than uh, just installing it on the server and hoping for the best. So, I mean, basically you're demonstrating that you didn't have Ansible installed and now you're installing it. So you're doing everything from the beginning, yeah? Yeah. And this is going to run away for a bit, but this is our entire Ansible installation process. Uh, essentially, if I didn't do the virtual machine uh, environment, we just install it with pip. And then there's one other thing I need to do, but it's also a pip command. I could have done a one line. I'm just going to point it out to you, though. And while we're waiting, the we'll talk about it. So because SSH use, or uh, Ansible uses SSH, uh, we need to ins make sure we have the Parameco uh, package installed there because that's what Python uses for SSH connections. So we would also need to install uh, Parameco, or I like to install uh, NetMeco because that installs the requirements and also has the uh, better tool. Uh, so we'll just get that. 30 seconds or so. All right, and then we're just gonna go ahead and install NetMeco. Now, if you're doing this just on your own, you just do Parameco, but because NetMeco depends on Parameco, we can get away with just installing this, and it's gonna make sure it gets, um, see there's Parameco there. Uh, it's gonna give us uh, the best of both worlds, in my opinion, so uh, I like to do it that way there, but if you wanna, if you took an exam or something, it's best to do this one. Now what a Red Hat exam would ask you a multiple choice question. It's all labs, but you know what I mean. Or maybe you don't. I don't know. I'm rambling. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, that is Ansible installed. So let's go back to our Davis directory. And remember, we have our host file. And we have our YAML. So what can we do with Ansible? So... What we're going to say is ansible doc and then list and this is going to give us quite a lot of stuff here in fact if i do pipe this into word count we have 5634 built-in modules uh, and this number goes up pretty much every version of ansible so we, if we wanted to, we could filter this. So we could say, hey, I want to look at Cisco iOS. And we could see even that's not good enough there because we also have iOS uh, XR, which is the service provider platform. So we're just gonna say dot iOS. So what we have here is um, a bunch of things that we can run on our Cisco devices when we get into there, but we can see that we can push uh, ACL, for example, or BGP or uh, some random configuration. Let's have a look at uh, layer three interfaces. So we're just gonna copy this name. And if we wanna see the actual help, we just take off the dash and then um, type in the name. And what this does is this gives us um, a description of what the module does here. So this is for adding layer three options on a device there. So this is adding IP addresses, that kind of thing. So we can see we can add addresses. It explains all the different fields. And then if we go down, we can see a bunch of examples. So this is really useful for building out your playbooks when we get that far, because you can basically just copy these and then you can edit them uh, to be what you want them to be. And then, um, It'll save you a lot of typing and confusion as you work forward there. But anyway, that is how we do that. So what we're going to do is we're going to run what's called an ad hoc command. And the ad hoc command is um, really uh, just there to help us verify particular information and get us what we need. So if I type Ansible, I can go ahead and tell it I want to run on routers and then I'm gonna do something called a ping. And it's gonna tell us, hey, I don't know what host to talk to, what's routers? Because I have to tell it to talk to one of the inventory files. So we're just gonna say hosts, and we'll pick on the INI file. So we can see that what this is doing is, uh, it is doing a quick sanity check. Now this is, you might think this is talking to each host there, but this is actually talking to, um, 
the host itself to make sure that all the logic's fine there. So it's not actually sending anything to the um, router. But if we wanted to, we can also verify that our YAML file is fine. And it is. So you can see they both work the same way, but we can go and find some information. So if I wanted to, I could do IOS facts. And one of the things that Ansible is really nice at is it uh, can give you a bunch of built-in facts here. So we can see that for uh, one of our routers that we have our IP addresses, we can see the, how much space, the host name, what kind of uh, version we're running, um, what masks and whatnot. So we get a ton of information here that we can use for our automation if we want to there. And this is all built into Ansible. So it's one of the uh, leg apps it has compared to a Python script. Because if you're doing this with Python, you would be manually coding this uh, yeah. so that it, uh, it has all this information. So we can see here we have like serial number, we can see version and which we'll play with in a little bit. And we can go from there, you can see model. Uh, so all in all, pretty good stuff. So what we're gonna do is we are going to go back to our PyCharm and we're gonna create a first payload book. So what we're gonna say is... So basically what you did there is you, the ping just verified that the um... The, the 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 ansible stuff was right and then when you did a like get information you actually connected to the devices yeah yeah so uh and remember this um uh for this to work this means a few things there so one our credentials are right uh two is that uh, we have our post defined properly and three is that uh we're uh have our network and stuff defined properly there because if we um, said this was a Genos device there, it would, it would uh, connect, see that the parser is different and probably freak out. So uh, uh, this is just a quick sanity check to do this kind of thing there. And sometimes you just need quick ad hoc information. Like you just want to be able to get this information, but you don't want to write a whole playbook. Yes. I mean, and you specified routers because in your YAML file, you had a router section and a switcher section, but you just did this on the routers, yeah? Yeah, so I called this uh, routers. I could also choose to enter in these if I wanted to do this individually, uh, because I define these are defined as actual names. So if I wanted to, I could say, and it would run just on that particular host. But because I said routers earlier, it ran on all three. Yeah, that's great. So you can do create a playbook now, yeah? Yep. So what is a playbook? So a playbook is kind of like a, I call it a bash script there, where it's a series of commands that you run that get your result there. So a playbook will have um, all our information uh, for what we're connecting to, uh, uh, like uh, what groups, and then uh, we're going to, have what we actually want done inside the host there. So for example, let's just create a goal there where we are going to, actually, you know what? I will create the file first and then we'll talk. Yeah. All right, so we're gonna say new file and it's just gonna be cisco.yaml. Now remember, we always have three lines at the top. And then what we need to do is tell it what host we care about. So it's gonna be hosts routers and of course if i call this david special adventure or whatever it was then that's what we would call it here now if we want to be able to use enable then we would go ahead and say become is yes uh if you wanted to enable um what you'd want to do is you want to say become password And I have the same secret for my password there, so you guys can hack my lab. But uh, basically, this is how we uh, how Ansible handles things like enable passwords or pseudo passwords. Is this what they call it? Become. And then, so we'll just say become yes. And then, what we're gonna do is we gotta tell it what tasks we're doing. So what we're going to say is we want to create loopback 
Oh, I don't know. Uh, eight, 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 eight. Now, how do we do that? I have no idea. Let's have a look at our help file. So, if we go back to here, we can see that we have a few choices. So we have iOS interfaces, layer two, and layer three. Now these are usually pretty well named there. So we can infer that interface is probably what we want. Uh, layer two would be like VLANs and stuff like that. And layer three would be IP addresses. So let's have a look at interfaces. And let's look at our examples. I like to just dive down to the examples because I can usually figure out what it's trying to tell me. I can see here that we're defining an interface. We're saying, hey, here's the description. We're enabling a duplex, all that stuff. And we can see that, I don't think there's many other examples here. Eh, good enough, we'll just copy this part. So we're just gonna copy the front part of this. Now we'll go back to our workbook. And I'm actually going to replace you with you. And then we're just going to say that this is great loopback in the weight. So what we have here is we're calling our module. And then under here, we're defining our config based on what it says. And we're right now, this is saying that we're going to add a description to, um, to Gigabit 2, which doesn't exist on the router. So we're just going to say that this is going to be loopback in the weight. And we can just leave the description of, uh, we'll just say, uh, created or gated. Now from here, we can see if there's any other options that are relevant to us. So let's go back to our help here. And we can see that we will have enabled, but that's probably a useful one. And if we go up here, we can explain what all the different fields need. So basically, uh, if we want it to be enabled, we say enable true. So we'll go back over here. And we'll just say enable true. So for happy with that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to commit. And this is going to upload this stuff to my uh, GitHub here. Uh, so we're just going to say added first playbook and we're going to commit and push which means it's just going to push it online all right so now on our ansible host we need to pull our change so we can see that is pulled these files long story short so if i was to look i now have cisco.yaml so that's the match you could get there's other ways we could do this uh, to sync there, but it's good to at least get people thinking about uh, how to do this kind of stuff. Uh, so at this point, I should be able to run this and we should create a loopback 888 with a description if this works out nicely. So before you before you do that, can you just yep. check on the device and do a show run to make sure that it's not there yet? Oh, you're doing the musician check the sleep then, eh? <laughs> All right, so there's no 888 here. Uh, there's a 999, so it's a 999. And you, I'm just going to assume there's a 999, but probably not an 888. Okay. Okay, so there's nothing above my sleeves, or in my sleeves, not above my sleeves. I that expression goes. <laughs> uh, all right, so we'll go back to our Ansible. And now I should be able to say Ansible playbook. Now we call the playbook and then we tell it what inventory file to use. So we're just going to say host YAML. Uh, you can do this in any order, um, but uh, because I just constructed this way there, it's basically going to say run this playbook and use this host file. If I don't, we already saw what happens there where it yells at me. So I'm going to try this, and if things are syntax properly, we're going to see it's going to run through the steps here. And we see that it's trying to run the task there. And so this is where the uh, it ran through. Everything's great. Uh, so it says that it created 
a loop back. So let's just first to see that we have a loop back up and we should see ready for David here. And of course, we never add an IP address, so uh, that's where that comes from. That's great. So that's that. Uh, oh, I was not done talking about this. So we can see that this has changed, and it's kept track of what has changed over the play recap. Now, because of the idempotency that I mentioned, if I run this again, what we should see is that it ran, but nothing changed. So we see it just says, okay, nothing has changed because it says, hey, you already have uh, a loop back uh, 888, so I don't need to. So if I go to one of these hooked rubbers and I say no, if I run this again, what we should see is that it's going to add one loop back. And it. So that's the basics of uh, running our first playbook. Now, we haven't done anything too fancy yet, but that is um, the nature of the beast there. But what we're gonna do now is just take it a step further and we're not gonna get too deep into the logic. We're just gonna add an IP address there. We're not gonna really worry about uh, duplicate IPs or anything quite yet. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go back to over to our help. Help but, is your but that's great. I mean, it, it, it's it's nice that it checks and makes sure that there's um, if it already exists, it just skips over. Yeah, and this uh, you don't want to have a situation there where you say like install Apache or web server or something, and then um, it interprets that. Well, I'm just gonna do the install. What if that wipes out all your configuration or something? So it's uh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, trying to be as uh, minimalistic as possible. So I'm gonna. Is, I like to call uh, IAC is insanely lazy. It's only going to work if it really needs to. Which is good. Yeah. You don't want it to be an overachiever, especially with uh, automation there, because uh, <laughs> this kind of stuff can be really scary if you're um, <laughs> doing this live. Um, all right. So we're going to go back to our help, which is if I scroll up, do I save typing? Maybe. Hmm. Okay, cool. So we've uh, looked at the interfaces and to add an IP address, we're just gonna go ahead and say uh, layer three. So again, we're gonna look at our help. There's no shame in asking for help in this kind of stuff, especially when you can copy and paste and save some typing. All right, so let's just see what we got here. So we can see that we have um, a few examples. So this one is adding an IP address and this one is removing it there. There's a concept called state there. We could say we want this to be present or we want this to be absent. Uh, and what we want in this one is we just want to say that, hey, we want an IP address. We don't really care about too much more. So I'm going to go ahead and Copy one of these guys. And we're gonna go back over to here. Now, remember, we wanna make sure our lines are lined up. So this is where our fancy tool for line highlighter is useful. So we're gonna say, add IP address to loop 888. Now we're just going to say loop 88. And we'll get this an IP address. I don't know, 192.168.88.0.0.0. And we'll now one nice thing about this there is that you can go ahead and use slash notation. It's going to figure out what makes sense for the platform. So this will put this in the proper network mask for us. So at this point, we're just going to go ahead and commit this. So again, we push. And I really should update the description, but uh, oh well. So now we'll go here and we're just going to say get pull. So I check our Cisco. We now have our new field here. So if I run this again, we 
you can see that it's okay with that there and it's added the IP. Now the obvious problem if we're doing this in production is I just push the same IP to all the uh, users there and uh, or all the routers and unless we're doing an any cast that's probably going to be a problem there so what we'd really do is we would define um, in our host file we would uh, create variables and we would uh, reference them there but we're not going to get too deep into the weeds uh, for our first showing unless we get really bored we'll find out yeah no i think it's uh, i think it's long enough i mean that gives us a good idea of the of the basics yeah fair enough so Donald, that's fantastic. I really appreciate you spending, you know, all this time showing us how, how this works. Um, you're a real advocate of of Ansible, is that right? Uh, yep, yeah, I quite like it. The only thing I don't like is Chef, uh, so we probably won't be making a video on that one. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we we won't cover Chef, but I mean, in that, what are we going to do in the next video? Well, in the next video, we'll take it a bit further there. Uh, so um, I know you guys uh, like talking about security a lot there, so. Uh, I thought it'd be fun to use Ansible as a compliance tool to make sure our configuration is um, working properly. Yeah, so like make sure that someone hasn't put a dumb password on or SNMP or something like that, yeah? Yeah, so we can make sure that like um, we can do what's called compliance. So we can say that, hey, uh, is the domain name uh, proper on this uh, device there? Or uh, do we have these features enabled? Or um, uh, just uh, basically what we can take is uh, we can make a basic template to uh, for what the security people uh, would like to see or the network best practices. And we can have Ansible not only um, let us know something is wrong, but we can have Ansible automatically correct it for us there. So if we have like a wrong domain name, for example, we can um, have it automatically correct it there without uh, uh, having any other things going on. And then I thought... Um, if we, if we don't get sick of talking about Ansible, we can also talk about things like Ansible Vault, which is uh, the uh, security mechanism for storing passwords. Um, and then um, probably as a separate meeting there, we'll talk about Ansible Tower, which is the uh, big boy version of Ansible that uh, uh, brings in a lot of uh, centralization and um, security features that a lot of people like. And that's the one where you actually pay for, so that should be uh, fun to look at. That'd be great. So, I mean, yeah, again, want to thank you for your time, and Donald, look forward to those new videos. Thanks. All right. See you, bud. Brilliant. Brilliant.